be your conductor for today's program. Railroads represent an essential part of American history. Our railroads tamed the frontier and brought every corner of our nation together. They played a leading role in building American commerce and hence America's destiny. In recent years, the growth of interstate highways and air transportation has diminished America's far-flung railroad system to a shadow of its former network. Our Amtrak service is a novelty compared to the once extensive and luxurious passenger service available during the first half of this century. For many, it's hard to comprehend that few members of the younger generation have ever ridden on a train. Despite this decline, few images are as universally romantic and loved as that of a powerful steam locomotive pulling a train. Railroads are a permanent part of our culture and psyche. From the little engine that could, to the shining time station, to the millions of model railroad sets enjoyed by children and adults alike, Americans love trains. Nothing inspires this love more than the magnificent steam locomotive. Although these machines were long ago switched off the main line of railroad history, a growing number of railroad enthusiasts worked tirelessly to keep steam railroading alive. Throughout America, dozens of short line railroads have been rebuilt to preserve America's great railroading heritage. And steam is the locomotive power of choice. Each year, millions of passengers visit these railroads to experience the history, the scenery, and the excitement of railroading. In this series, we will take you to some of the leading historic railroads in America and introduce you to the people and the machines that each year delight so many people. Today we will visit the famous Georgetown Loop Narrow Gauge Railroad in Central Colorado. Built in the 1870s to serve the booming mining towns of Georgetown and Silver Plume, the Georgetown Loop was truly one of the engineering marvels of its time. The line rises over 600 feet between the two towns, making several sharp curves and actually loops back over itself to negotiate the grade in this spectacular valley. Ah, the scenery, the engineering, the history are fantastic, but it's the sights and sounds of the steam locomotives that steal the show. Climb on board now for the fun and excitement of America's historic steam railroading. Here now is the Georgetown Loop Railroad. There is a romance about a steam engine, and a steam engine can be very, very quiet when it is not under steam, and still, because, you know, it is an artifact from the past, I think people uh, tend to uh, really enjoy it, but when it comes under steam, then it becomes alive. And, and has a personality, and people can relate to that. And it has sounds uh, that, uh, starting with very young children, choo, 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 you know, they can emulate those sounds and, and identify with a steam engine. line it's like nothing in the world it's it's got its own sets of rewards it's got its own sets of challenges it started out as, as a as an adventure started um, uh, there was a lot of fun in in building something but uh, once it was built and the excitement of, of things happening in the way of laying track getting railroad equipment things like this uh, then it became a business it is a family operation, and that's rather gratifying. What started out to be what you might have called a, a love of our lives, uh, 
uh, is still something we are very fond of, but we're very much in business. Yeah, Rosa says you're going to be able to do a little bit. The Colorado State Historical Society owns all of the land and the trackage and the buildings. And uh, the, all the railroad equipment itself, the locomotives and the cars and that sort of thing, is owned by the Georgetown Loop Railroad. And uh, it is operated under a concessionaire's agreement. The shop building is also owned by the state. And uh, that's included in the agreement is where we can do all our maintenance in the shop. Really, the railroad operates for three months during the summer, and the whole rest of the year, the railroad keeps a crew of guys here in the shop working on the engines in the cars to keep them uh, to keep them operating. Always, you've got uh, bearings to rebuild and replace, and gears to work on. And of course, none of this is stock off-the-shelf items. If we need new parts, they have to be manufactured from scratch. It's definitely more than a job. And when you step back and, and look at some of the things that we have to do to keep these operating, I think it has to be more than a job. Because some of, the, some of the things, particularly on these locomotives, boiler work and working on this grubby, horrible, greasy mess down here uh, is, is pretty distasteful work, I would think, in most people's uh, view. And so I think that there has to be something more uh, spurring you on in order to, uh, to uh, make you want to do this. Not only are our steam locomotives a challenge and interesting to work on, but they're, uh, they're a challenge and interesting to operate also in that uh, everything the operators do is directly translated into how the engine operates. The steam engine is a mechanical wonder in this day and age, I would say, mainly because there are still so many of them still operating, and it's definitely a, a, a tribute to the design and the people who built them. The locomotive has a, a boiler on it that is filled with water. And then at the rear end of the boiler, there is a firebox where you can burn whatever you'd like. Uh, locomotives generally burn either coal, wood, or oil. And this generates heat to make steam. And the steam is uh, drawn off and fed into cylinders where it uh, just the pressure of the steam and the expansion quality of the steam is, uh, uh, makes a cylinder uh, go back and forth, and through this mechanism, it's translated into uh, a motion. Generally, when you're running, that's you fall pretty much into a routine of uh, operating the brakes and and that sort of thing. But uh, at any particular time, something unexpected could happen. The whistle is used as a, as a signaling device and as a warning device. Uh, it, uh, it is a warning to people or animals or whatever who are on the track. It also signals to the crew on the train what the engineer intends to do. There's a sense of gratification and pride and when you go around the corner you look back and you can see the train following you down, all full of happy people. It's definitely uh, uh, appealing. The history of the Georgetown Loop um, revolves around uh, the spiral that is called the loop, where the train uh, crosses over itself 
it was considered quite a, a engineering uh, marvel as well as a scenic marvel. What made the Georgetown Loop really famous was all the spirals and circles of track, of continuous track, to reach that distance uh, between Georgetown and Silverplume. The um, mining camps uh, were in the mountains, and so narrow gauge afforded a much cheaper way of uh, twisting, winding around uh, the hills and climbing a much steeper uh, grade than you could with the old standard gauge. Narrow gauge tracks um, are only three feet apart between the rails uh, compared to um, standard gauge, which uh, is four feet eight and a half inches and was claimed to be the distance between the chariot wheels of the old Roman char chariots. The grades between um, Georgetown and Silver Plume really did make it an, an engineering marvel. Uh, they averaged uh, three and a half to four feet rise per hundred feet. We call that percent grade three and a half to four percent grades, which were quite steep and was necessary uh, along with the curves to uh, compress a lot of track, a, a lot more length of track within the, the two mile air distance between the uh, two towns. You know, we're often asked about our diesel locomotive and of course this is what killed the steam engine, uh, probably in the late 40s, 50s. Um, the diesel did replace all the steam locomotives, and that's why we're in business today. We have one of them up here, and we love it. Uh, it does everything for us. The diesel locomotive is, uh, is very handy for us in that uh, you can just climb into it and essentially push a button and start the engines, and it's ready to go in 10 minutes as opposed to six hours for the steam engine. What we were doing this morning, uh, the, this tank car, which was on the side track over there, needed to be brought in to be worked on. So that's what we did. We just went over, picked it up, and, and uh, put it inside the house here. The Georgetown Loop is like riding back into history because you do not have railroads that are like this in the states other than having been recreated uh, from a historical railroad and th the uh, the locomotives are historical the um, information given from by the uh, conductors is historical so it it is a, a step back into history for uh, for a brief time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Georgetown Loop Railroad. For those of you who may be wondering if we're going the wrong way, we really aren't. We back away from the depot for the simple reason that the, narrow, the valley here is just so narrow we can't turn the train around. So on our downhill trip, we put the engine at the rear of the train and he'll pull us down the hill. And at the bottom of the hill, we'll put the engine on the front of the train and he'll pull us back up the valley. The railroad that you're riding on this morning is a reconstructed portion of the old Georgetown, Breckenridge, and Leadville Railway. You may have noticed those initials, GB and L, on the side of the cars. The first railroad in the area was the Colorado Central Railroad, which began construction in Denver in 1870. It came west following Clear Creek, which is the little stream you see alongside of us here. It passed through the town of Idaho Springs, finally reaching Georgetown in 1877. About the turn of the century, this became the Colorado and Southern Railway, and on the mountain side of the train here, you'll see a little spur track with a red locomotive. That's engine number nine of the old Colorado and Southern Railway, one of only five narrow-gauge Colorado and Southern engines still in existence. As I mentioned, this was just the stub end branch line from Denver, but it was a very profitable line back in the early days, bringing miners, their families, and supplies up to the mountain communities and taking the rich ore back to the Denver and Golden area to be processed. This continued until the silver panic of 1893, when the price of silver dropped so low that no one could mine it and make a profit at it. It caused most of the mines here in the upper Clear Creek Valley to close, as this was primarily a silver-producing region. Fortunately for the railroad, this loss of freight revenue was more than offset by a large increase in tourism. 
As the fame of the Georgetown Loop spread throughout the country and even the world, thousands of people were coming to ride on what was considered a scenic and engineering marvel of the 19th century. The heavy tourism continued on into the early 1900s. However, as they improved the roads in the area and built more dependable automobiles, folks turned to their own cars for their pleasure and business trips to the mountains instead of riding the train. They did operate two or three freight trains a week until the late 1930s, but finally in 1938 they did petition the state to abandon the line. The petition was granted, and in 1939 the rails and bridges from Silver Plume to Idaho Springs were taken up and sold for scrap. Our story would have ended there as it did for many of Colorado's early mountain railroads, except in the 1960s the highway department began planning to build the interstate right up the middle of this valley. It would have destroyed our railroad grade and the mining history. The Colorado Historical Society felt that history should be preserved. They were successful in getting the highway department to locate the interstate over on the side of Republican Mountain where you see it today. With that done, they began rebuilding the railroad in 1973, starting at Silver Plume, and by 1975, we were able to operate our first trains. We've run every summer since then. In 1984, with a grant from the Betcher Foundation of Denver, they rebuilt the high bridge at the mouth of the canyon, and this is now our ninth season of running over the entirely rebuilt loop. As we round this curve called High Fill, you'll have one of your best scenic views on the line. As soon as you're clear of the trees to the outside of the curve or the right as you face the locomotive, you'll see the high bridge across the mouth of the canyon and beyond it a glimpse of Georgetown. On the inside of the curve, for you photographers and rail fans, a nice shot of engine number 14. As we continue around the curve, we're going to be entering a cut in the mountainside. You might notice the rock retaining walls in here. These walls were hand built in the 1880s when the line was first constructed. You'll notice that they use no mortar, but they did such a fine job of fitting and placing these rocks. They've been there now for over 100 years with very little maintenance, a real tribute to the skill of the workmen of that day. As we come out of the cut, we are going to be stopping now at the Lebanon Mine Tour Stop. One of the nice features we have is probably the Lebanon Silver Mine. And if you are taking the mine tour, uh, you would lay, literally lay over there for about an hour and 20 minutes and you would be met by guides from the Historical Society and taken on a tour of the, the outbuildings um, that are reconstructed like the mine manager's house, the pest house, the change room, uh, and then you would uh, see the um, part of the old Lebanon mill that is still undergoing restoration and you would walk about 800 feet underground, literally under uh, Interstate 70 between uh, Georgetown and Silver Plume. It's kind of a level walk underneath and uh, it's well lit inside and the guides take you in and describe uh, the, the mining of the area. We're often asked about the equipment we use here on the loop. Our train today is being powered by locomotive number 14. This engine was built back in 1916 by the Lima Locomotive Works of Lima, Ohio. It's a rather unusual geared engine called a Shay, S-H-A-Y, after its inventor, Mr. Ephraim Shay. The locomotive has three vertical boilers mounted on the right-hand side to power a flexible drive line running the full length of the engine and tender. All the wheels, even those of the tender, are geared off this drive line, which gives the engine tremendous pulling power but very little speed. It burns fuel oil to convert the water in the boiler into steam, and steam is what makes everything work. Devil's Gate uh, Bridge is still a uh, marvel. At the turn of the century, it was probably called the eighth wonder of the, of the modern world. The Devil's Gate uh, Bridge, it has a curve, and so as the engines are on the, uh, the bridge, you are still entering the curve, and you can see the bridge uh, pretty much while you are on it and really get a feel for uh, what the, uh, the bridge is all about. You might take a real good look at the bridge. It is an almost exact replica of the original high bridge. That original bridge was built in the winter of 1883 and 84. It was made of cast and wrought iron pieces resting on cut granite blocks. It cost a quarter of a million dollars, quite a sum of money in those days. In 1939, when the railroad was abandoned, the bridge was cut up for scrap and sold for only $450. 
This new bridge was built in the summers of 1983, completed in the summer of 1984. This one's made of very modern heavy duty steel resting on reinforced concrete. It is about five times stronger than the original bridge, which is very good because we do have heavier equipment now than they had in the old days. This particular bridge cost $1 million to build, which is a four times inflation factor over the original bridge. However, in that same 100 year period, everything else went up more than four times, so that's not bad at all. From the track we're on to the track on the top of the bridge will be a rise of 75 feet. When you get up there and look back down, remember it's still only 75 feet. It won't be any higher when you're looking down. The uh, railroad has two terminals. Uh, there's the uh, Georgetown boarding area, or we sometimes refer to it as the uh, Devil's Gate uh, boarding area. And then you can also board at the uh, Silver Plume Depot. You can board at either end and get a, a round trip. In front of the old Georgetown station, we have probably the first love of our life, which is engine 44. Uh, it came from El Salvador and was the first one to operate for us. And it, it operated uh, many years with uh, minor repairs and has finally just gotten tired. She has a very important part out in front of this building. The uh, old Georgetown station, where we have our offices, our gift shop, our cafe, and exhibit area, started out as the original Colorado and Southern Depot, was built about 1877. The, the building has always been in this location. Uh, the area around it has changed drastically. Uh, we have a picture from the 50s where this was sitting out in the middle of a field. Today. It's a very uh, active place, again, uh, with the exhibits showing pictures of Georgetown. Uh, there's a historical picture of the loop uh, in, uh, at the end of the building. Then the uh, gift shop is mainly uh, railroad items, but uh, you'll find also uh, Colorado uh, items in the gift shop. Uh, we have an area that uh, has a Western artist, uh, Raphael Lillywhite, and uh, then the cafe, which has its own model railroad. So when, when the real railroad isn't operating, people can come in and enjoy seeing the model railroad as well. The sound of a, of a steam locomotive working hard is, is uh, is pretty timeless and interesting as, as well as being surprisingly loud. It is a very beautiful area and I definitely enjoy looking out the window so to speak and, and you don't really get tired of, of, uh, of watching the things go by. in this area because we're right in the uh, uh, 
in the zone or the altitude where they they like to be. So in a lot of cases along the highway or the railroad, you can come very close and people can see them uh, right up close. Our riders on the train are are generally tourists who are uh, in the mountains for a, for a day trip and it find it to be a, a pleasant way to see the scenery and experience the the antique equipment. Silver Plume is next. Silver Plume. As we arrive at our Silver Plume terminal, you might want to visit the old Silver Plume Depot. The office in Silver Plume looks like it did more than 100 years ago. There are train logs on the wall. On the desk is a coffee pot and cup, and of course the telegraph. Looks as if someone just used it yesterday. Well, I just love that big bridge that we just went over. And I hope we come back next time. What I really liked about this trip was the scenery and the narration and the over the bridge looking down over the water. It was really pretty. It was a nice trip. It's, it's just a, a great way to, uh, to spend the day. There's a scenic overlook going eastbound between Silver Plume and Georgetown. And if you stop there, you get to see a live, a live model railroad because you can see almost the entire uh, railroad. When I stand on that uh, scenic overlook, I probably look at it differently than the regular tourist because I have 20 some years of memories that uh, crop up. When husbands and wives work together, um, so often uh, in the, it's a per public perception that uh, the man is, is doing everything and that the wife is tolerating this, particularly when it involves something to do with railroads. Not the case with us. This has been, from day one, a total partnership um, of everything we do. There is no, no boss in the family of this. Uh, we're both equally. Uh, responsible as well as, as I hope, uh, sharing in the rewards of it. to our life that we might not have otherwise had had we both of us gone down the corporate track. In looking back over the uh, the 20 some years that we have been involved in this there are are many many pleasures that uh, I, I might have. One is that we have created something that uh, people from all over the world can enjoy. And there's a certain um, certain nice feeling, not smugness, just a nice feeling in, in having been able, uh, rather common people, been able to be a part of, of rebuilding this part of the heritage and, and to have it passed on to, to generations to follow us. This is Bob Shriver again. I hope you enjoyed today's program about the Georgetown Loop Railroad. Be sure to watch for future programs on America's historic steam railroads. Mm -hmm.